Stuff Podcasts. Just a heads up, this episode has a little bit of swearing in it. This episode of What's Wrong With You is sponsored by Every Human, an online platform selling life-changing adaptive clothing, footwear and lifestyle products. It's the home of the ultimate shopping experience for people with disabilities. Shop the range at everyhuman.com.au. Hey Bex, how long do you think we've known each other for? Mm, I don't know. Nine years? Ten? It must have been uh, early 2012. Early 2012. It was February 27th, 2012, actually, at 10.30am outside the town hall. So that's exactly nine years, 91 days, 14 hours, and uh, 16 seconds, actually 18 seconds, 20 seconds. That's pretty precise, Olivia. Well, that day was really unforgettable for me. Meeting you was a big deal. True, it was for me too. I've always thought of it like a scene from a rom-com. You know how they always have that meet-cute scene where the future couple bump into each other, even though ours is just a friendship meet-cute? Like in a Notting Hill bookstore. Um, can I help you at all? No thanks, I'll just look around. Or in a New York City department store. Fine. No, Go ahead. please. Buying black cashmere gloves. Uh, or Stay back. on a doomed ocean liner. Don't come any closer. That's my favorite, I think. Come on, just give me your hand, I'll pull you back over. Yeah, exactly. And I don't know if they're going to make a movie about us or anything because our friendship is not technically a romance and you're actually getting married to someone else soon. But I do like telling people about our meet cute. So it was orientation day at university. There were heaps of first year students in the city. I saw one other wheelchair user in the crowd and that happened to be you, Bex. I didn't know anyone else, so I just wheeled on over and said hi. And I'm so glad you did. I'm Olivia Shivers. And I'm Rebecca Dubber. And you're listening to What's Wrong With You, Stuff's podcast about disability. We both use wheelchairs and live in a world that's not designed for disabled people. In this podcast, we're covering faith, what it's like traveling in a wheelchair, parenting a child with a disability. And we also try to answer some of the big mysteries facing people living with disabilities, such as why are random shop assistants so damn interested in whether our ovaries work or not? This episode, though, we're focusing on relationships and not just the one between Bex and me. We're talking about all the awkward stuff like dating and sex and whether or not to include your wheelchair in Tinder photos. First up, we have Lauren Savage. She lives in Wellington with her husband, Mark, and they have a cat called Minnie. Our conversation started with a quick linguistics lesson. For me, the correct term uh, is that I'm a little person um, or I have a chondroplasia dwarfism. If I'm with my um, little people or my LP friends, uh, we have, we're pretty free and frank with each other about what we can and can't do and it will turn into a comical experience for us. If it's a random person in the street, uh, then there is quite a few lines that are quite easy to cross. And I guess the first one is um, using what we refer to as the M word, which mm-hmm. is the, the, the midget word. Uh, and for me personally, actually, I probably wouldn't even use that jokingly with my friends mm-hmm. because yeah. it has so many negative connotations and we're trying so hard to stop people using it because they don't know, they haven't had mm-hmm. the education. So, Lauren, when did you realise that you had a disability? I don't know, actually, well and truly. Like, I always knew. I think my mum um, and my dad were just, it was part of life, is that I was, so my family's all average height, uh, including my older sister, uh, and it was just always a part of my life. Like, I was always involved with the Little People of New Zealand organisation. Uh, my first conference was when I was one, so I don't really remember it. Uh, I don't remember it all, actually. <laughs> Uh, but, you know, so that was always a thing. I went to the Little People's Conference once a year because I was a little person. So it's just been a huge part of me um, growing up. And growing up, what was your exposure to disability and dating or seeing disabled people in relationships? When I started to be, like, interested in, like, guys and having crushes or all that sort of stuff, that was kind of a weird thing because 
there was no no kind of role models around me, you know, and there was no... Also, for men, there was no one out there normalising it for them, so average height mm-hmm. men, mm-hmm. Um, and there was no one kind of saying, actually, it's OK, it's not It's going to be fine, it's not different, it's, you know, you may have these extra struggles from society's perspective, mm. but so there was no guys around me that were thinking that way. It was kind of always like either she was was friend zoned or it was like, no, I wouldn't do that, straight out no kind of thing. When I started dating Mark, who's my now husband, uh, it was definitely a kind of a learning experience for both of us because um, he'd never dated a little person. Um, And sorry, my husband's average height, like above average height, he's quite tall, <laughs> which is quite convenient. Um, but, you know, so that so it was a learning experience for both of us, which was quite neat, I think. And I think we both realised that it was a learning experience for both of us, so we were kind of helping each other because there was no one else really there to guide us or, or to say that it's OK or to be like, yeah, you are going to be dealing with X, Y, Z comments or mm. these people's approach attitudes or... Actually, it's the looks more than the comments. Mm. You know, it's the patronising looks more, yeah, than, yeah. more than anything um, of, of how amazing he is. Uh, that, that sort of stuff, which is uncomfortable for him. Like, he, didn't, yeah. he, didn't, he doesn't want people being like, oh, you're so amazing because you're dating. Congratulations. You're dating. Yeah, congratulations. <laughs> you're dating a disabled person. Like, you're doing a really good service, you know. Mm-hmm. Like, um, I mean, good on him for dating me, absolutely. Yeah. Like, but it's not because of your short stature. <laughs> no, no, not at all. So, yeah, it was definitely a a learning experience for both of us. When guys would express some sort of interest in me, whether it be up, you know, like at a bar or all that, straight away it's like that thought of like, they're just interested in me because it's a novelty. Like, Mm. it's, they've never been with a little person, you know, like they've, or they've never talked to another little person or they're just trying to suss you out more because you're a little person, not because you've got the same interests and you've been watching the same sports game. Yeah, let's talk a bit about where that kind of novelty factor comes from when it comes to disability. I definitely think there are a type of person out there that do fetish fetish, fetish 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 have fetishes fetishes Um, for women with disabilities, whether that's a little person, someone who uses a wheelchair, um, and it was quite prevalent within like the amputee communities. Um, And with the rise of social media, there's a lot of um, accounts out there that are quite like predatory. And like I know through my time, like my my Instagram, Facebook DMs have been filled with rather inappropriate comments and Mm. questions and Mm. marriage proposals. Um, I think I, around the time that I went to the London Paralympics, I had like a public figure page um, to post all my results from my swimming and keep everyone updated. Um, and the London Paralympics was huge, so I gained like 20,000 like likes to that page mm-hmm. over the two weeks of the Games. And <laughs> with that 20,000 likes came, you know, a whole lot of very inappropriate comments and um, just requests and things, all really relating to the fact that there was some lonely men out there looking for, you know, someone who they felt was beneath them. Um, and I ended up having to delete that page because I couldn't keep up and I just felt increasingly anxious and disgusted and just very unsafe because the type of man, I think, or person that um, comes into you know, your DMs or send you those types of messages, they don't react very nicely when you Mm. say no. Mm. And I think that that kind of gave me a lot of hesitancy around dating as well because I had always felt that, you know, I would be lucky if I got a boyfriend or if I found someone that liked me. He would be lucky. First of all, that's horrible that you had that experience. (laughs) Um, And... Oh, it would have been, I can imagine how uncomfortable that would have been. I have, like, the odd one every now and then, but not to that level and not when, I mean, they have no idea who I am, so it's all right, I just block them. Mm. But men with a disability mm. aren't taught about yeah. healthy relationships mm. and that because they are almost 
in a similar way to us kind of kind of that pressure on just to settle and and you know if you find someone good on you because mm. it's good if they if they're willing to wake up and look at that you know or or deal with the the mm. extra support needs or whatever mm. it is that you need and i think that whole yeah perception of dating a person with a disability and the kind of gross side to it um, is definitely challenging as a young woman because if someone so happens to be interested in you or starts talking to you on Instagram or on a dating app, it was always in the back of my mind, are they interested in me or are mm. they interested mm. in my disability? Mm. Um, and that is just, it's so hard because then you like invest, you know, you do invest a mm. bit of time into that and emotional energy and you can't figure that out straight away. No. And then it's impacting on who you are around yeah. them because you're like, yeah. I might want to guard this part of my life yeah. because I don't yeah. want you to see um, that actually today I am, oh, you know, like I'm really struggling being a disabled woman in today's society, you know, yeah. today because yeah. I've, yeah. I've dealt with this, this and this. But then you're like, oh, I don't want to tell them that because mm. what will they think? Yeah. And they, you know, will, will that kind of feed their interest in be- me being disabled or will they be like, well, that's a bit too much, you know, I wasn't prepared to deal with that or whatever. Yeah, I mean, I went on a first date once and we'd been chatting on a dating app for a little bit and then, um, but one of the first questions he asked me was, why are you in a wheelchair? And I was like, oh, great, I wasted all this time. I mean, Mm. it should have been a red flag because he did ask me out on a date to the coffee club, so. (laughs) okay, okay. (laughs) But then in saying that and reversing that, yeah. mm. If he hadn't have mentioned it, what would you have done? Would you have been totally okay? Like, t- to what point mm. um, do you feel, like, when is the right time? Like, that is true. Because that otherwise, is true. otherwise you're like, oh, they're not mentioning it. Or they'll be like, I, I don't see your disability. And you're like, clearly I'm disabled. Yeah. But yeah, it's like that, yeah, it's that yeah, balancing yeah, yeah. line. Yes, um, well, I think the fact that it was, like, the first question he asked. Yeah, maybe the first question um, But then I'd been on other dates where it didn't really come up, but we so happened to be talking about something else, and I talked about access, and he was like, oh, yeah, true, I'd never thought about that before. Or, you know, maybe it'd come up later on, um, being like, oh, so, what, you know, what's the name of your condition, or how does it affect mm. your life? Like, um, it seems to be, yeah, it's more about the interest in me, not just like, oh, like, why can't you walk? I think one of the most valuable pieces of advice I ever got given when it came to dating was... When people show you or tell you who they are, believe them. I think that um, that really helped me get through some tricky situations where, um, you know, I might have been talking to someone on a dating app and I was really starting to like them, but then they would make, you know, a comment that raised a bit of a red flag. Of course, I made mistakes where I kept going and Mm. ended Mm. up really hurt and upset and betrayed. But then, you know, you learn from those experiences and you know for next time that that red flag comes up that, oh, okay, yeah, I'm walking away now. Yeah. Rolling, Rolling away. away. Ha! <laughs> Jinx. <laughs> Met my fiancé on a dating app. So we started dating, having no, no prior, like, experience or friendship to go off um but disability never really came up in our conversations either and it was almost like a hard one for me to grapple with initially because I was waiting for it to come up Mm -hmm. like I was waiting for there to be a you know why why are you disabled or what does this mean for our future or you know can we have kids and do you think you'll have that conversation one day well, I kind of After think... After he listens to this podcast. <laughs> I mean, I kind of just think that from everything that we've been through, because we've been together for almost five years, nice. and I think that through everything we've been together through the hospital appointments. I mean, he um, was there when I had my last elbow surgery, which, mm. you know, for the recovery period, you know, he was having to help me shower um, and do everything for me. When you got your arm surgery, Mitch had to help you, mm. but it's kind of the only time he's really had to help you have a shower, for example. Mm. And I think there's also this assumption out there that if you are married or dating or in a relationship with someone with a disability, um, you are going to also be in that carer role. And for some relationships, that does work, but it's not always like that. That's not always the situation. Mm. Everyone goes through challenges where, you know, someone needs more support in a certain season of their life and then the other person needs more support or extra care. Mm. And we all go through health challenges and ups and downs, whether you have a disability or not. Yeah, as you said, each couple has 
different times where they are relying on each other for different things, whether it be emotionally or physically or financially or or whatever it is. Mm. And I think it, but it, sometimes it does um, look that way that it is going to be an extra burden on the people. And I think it's because media promotes that message. Mm. I'm not saying that we shouldn't highlight um, the fact that disabled people do need more support in different circumstances, but I think that's not the only message. Mm. And it's up to some people who um, who that person is to do that support. Like you felt mm. comfortable with your um, fiancé doing that, whereas other people might not, and that's totally fine. If they yep. want to get a support worker in, yep. Yep. they should be able to get yeah, a support worker yeah, in to do yeah. that, or if they don't want that. Like for me personally, I go to turn to Mark to do that. I'd mm. feel more comfortable because he's seen me naked anyway, so one yeah, less person seeing well. <laughs> see me naked is always a good sign. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, it's it should be up to those people, them to make that decision or not society's mm, kind of mm. pressure or assumptions. How did you learn to trust Mark that he was dating you for the right reasons? I think time was it. Mm. Um, I think time was a big thing, but it was just that, like, you know, like this real roller coaster and to, to be in a more intimate relationship. That yeah, it was it was a journey. It was I don't know if there was one pinpoint, but I, as as I said, it's nothing on what he did. I think it was just really on my own insecurities, which was quite interesting because I didn't realise how insecure I was about myself until I started dating someone. Mm. And I was yeah. always like, Yeah, I'm proud of being a little person, I'm proud yeah. feminist. And then I just remember kind of a few months into it being like Actually, Lauren, you're quite insecure about mm. yourself, you know, and mm. because my identity was changing, I was no, lo- you know, part of my identity was that I was Mark's girlfriend, not not a keep up, but it was a bit of, a, you know, a bit of a change, and all that. And yeah, I didn't realize how like how much I cared about how I looked or, or what I did, yeah, or yeah. or yeah, it weighed on me quite a lot, and it was quite interesting for me to learn that stuff about myself. I definitely think that uh, investing in our young people, mm. disabled or not, is so key so that, you know, the next generation of young women and young men with disabilities can go out and start chatting to someone at the youth group, at the, at a pub, at a park, at a sports game, and be like, I'm confident that everyone's okay with disability. So actually they're interested in talking to me because I'm supporting the same team as them or I've got the same faith as them or whatever it is. I think it's just so important that we invest in our our next generation for their sake. When you go on a date, your focus should be on asking the hard questions. Do they like pineapple on pizza? Which way do they hang the toilet paper? And are they a cat person or a dog person? And what happens next if their answer is different to yours? Your focus shouldn't be on the struggle you'll have later on trying to get your shirt off. Adaptive online platform Every Human has accessibility-focused lifestyle products and clothing styles for all occasions, so your next date can be a breeze. Every Human is making sure you feel cute for their upcoming coffee date, or perhaps you'd feel more comfortable in something a bit more cosy, like track pants, for a movie night on the couch. Every human's range of accessible lifestyle products, footwear, tees, tops and shirts are all designed with disabled people and their success in mind, taking away any of those extra worries you might have and helping you be your most confident. With every human, Whether it be in the lifestyle, clothing or footwear department, you'll make a great first impression. So you can focus on what really matters, like getting your shirt off easily. Oh, and making sure there's chemistry. Our next guest is Timothy Young. He's an entrepreneur, a husband and a new dad to five-month-old Jasper. He's a C5 tetraplegic after breaking his neck while snowboarding in Canada 12 years ago. He lost the use of 84% of his body, but can still feel from around the chest up. Tim now lives in Hamilton, so we gave him a call. The thing about Tim is that because he'd gone through his teenage years without a disability, 
he was able to do a bit of compare and contrast. Dating as a non-disabled person and dating as a wheelchair user. So I had my accident when I was just before my 21st birthday, so I'd had all my teenage years and my university years able-bodied. I had a few girlfriends that, um, and when I was a teenager and a few casual partners during university and I had as much trouble as the next guy, but um, yeah, not nothing like now <laughs> since my accident. What were your first thoughts when it came to like dating and relationships after you had your accident? Yeah, when I was in the spinal unit at the start, I thought a lot about sex and how I'd actually be able to perform it and what it would feel like. And um, obviously there was actually quite a lot of grieving involved with mm -hmm. not being able to feel um, anymore and um, not have that same sexual experience. Uh, but you kind of do think, figure out ways around it and it's, and it's not the same, but... Um, it can be better in a lot of ways because you really are focusing on the emotional side of things and it's less shallow. And um, it's good to have that hope that it still can be um, very enjoyable. But it, it is something to really acknowledge that it's, it's quite a hard thing, especially um, as a teenage um, boy, well, I was 20, but yeah, it mm -hmm. was quite a big part of your life and um, and whether you like it or not, as a male that age, it completely dominates your thinking for mm. a good decade or something. Um, so yeah, it, it is quite quite a big part, but um, I was pretty worried about it, thought about it quite a bit and, you know, how I'd start a family. Um, and my mum was like, just all worried about having a family. <laughs> and so mum was being really embarrassing and being like, so do we need to freeze sperm? Like, do we need to get, we, oh. We need to get on this early. <laughs> and they, they keep saying, oh, no, it's fine, you know, you can go, if, even if um, you can't get sperm from ejaculate later, then you could go in, like, a procedure in the testes and grab some out. And she was, like, double-checking. She got about four different opinions today. <laughs> you sure you're not going to screw up? I need some grand grandkids. So, yeah. <laughs> it was, it was pretty, pretty funny. You kind of brushed it off, but... Um, my, normal mum being normal mum. So we went through the IVF route and because I um, am lucky enough to be an ACC client, they pay for that. So we had lined it up for a couple of years, me and my wife, and yeah, all the timing fell in place and everything went according to plan and we were lucky enough for the embryo to fertilise on our first attempt. So it was really good. So earlier you talked about how um when you first had your accident and you were kind of getting back out there, how it was really different to when you were not disabled. Um, tell us how you met your wife. Yeah. Um, so I, I did a bit of the Tinder game just because, I mean, it's always a numbers game anyway, right? And um, it, more so when you're in a chair, you might be like, you know, one in five or ten girls would have been interested before and it was more like one in 30 or 50. Um, so Tinder was good because you <laughs> swipe lots of people. Um, <laughs> and, and did a bit of dating, so I got a bit of confidence from that. Um, and then I was lucky enough to meet my wife in person um, at our educational psychology class, which was ideal. It's nice to meet someone in person. Mm -hmm. um, but, but the online dating did give me more confidence to get out there and just go for it. There was a date um, before I met Erica, um, halfway through my catheter bag filled up <laughs> and I needed to ask my date to help empty my catheter bag, <laughs> uh, oh, no. which w w wasn't ideal, but she was very sweet about it and helped me out, but otherwise I would have peed myself. Actually, Erica had to empty my bag, my wife had to empty my bag on, my, on our second date and she was totally fine with it and it wasn't awkward and, you know, she gave me a kiss afterwards and I was like, oh, you know, this is great. <laughs> so it was pretty, 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 pretty obvious that, um, that, she was, that she could well be the one, <laughs> not, yeah. not for that reason alone, but um, for all the, all the other reasons. And that's just, um, yeah, a good, a good litmus test, I guess. Mm, yeah, I mean, as tough as dating can be when you are disabled, in a way it is kind of like a good filter, hopefully, for the, kind of the, the better quality people out there. Exactly. Do you have any dating advice for other disabled people who might be keen to kind of get out there and find someone? 
the two most important things I found was just being really, you know, being a positive person is really helpful. Like that's easier said than done for a lot of people with tough circumstances. But, um, and, you know, not don't just put on a fake face because that doesn't, that doesn't help as well. But if you can kind of, I think what really helps is if you're confident in yourself and you, um, you know, you focus, focus on all the good things that you got going for you and try and work on the things that, you, you know, that might be negatives and um, just get to a point where you're confident with yourself and then you're going to be just more positive about the whole experience and um, more approachable and you're more likely to not take things so seriously. And peop- I think people really pick up on that. Um, and they feel feel more comfortable because that's the, one of the things around disability is it's just kind of new and people don't know. You know, they might feel uncomfortable just because it's new and it's different, not necessarily because they don't like it. Um, so yeah, I think I think all that really helps and and just actually um, actively try. Um, and it, you know, it's scary putting yourself out there and you're setting yourself up for rejection, um, which takes a bit of thick skin, but just actively trying, going on the, the dating websites and, and um, you know, don't be afraid if there's a cute person at the, you know, behind the coffee bar, just, uh, just ask them out and, like, you know, you'll get more confident um, for next time if you, even if you get rejected, you'll kind of get used to being rejected and you'll brush it off faster and, yeah, just try your mum, is she stoked that she has a grandchild now? Is she, is, is Jasper the first one? Yeah. Or? Oh, she is. Mum is so stoked she has a grandchild mm-hmm. and it is the first one. She's very, very, very excited. That's and awesome. she's already already looking forward to the next one. <laughs> we're, we're just trying to, get our, trying to get our heads around this one at this stage. Next up is Henrietta Bollinger. She's a writer and advocate who works in the queer community. Isha and I actually go way back to our intermediate school days. She now lives in Wellington. So we video called her from our office in Auckland and started off with our favourite uncomfortable question. Our podcast title is What's Wrong With You? Oh, so many things. Um, I was thinking about how when that question gets asked to you, like, in public or by particularly by strangers. It's happened so many times and yet every single time I'm still just always like shocked. Like, really? You felt like that was an acceptable question. I kind of am keeping a role for myself at the moment that I it, I explain myself to kids and I don't explain myself to adults because I feel like kids Number one, it comes from a different place for them. It's just really genuine curiosity. But also you're making an investment. Kids will just take at face value what you tell, you know, they'll just believe you. They'll believe what you tell them about yourself. And um, and if you have a conversation with a kid, then you're kind of making an investment so that in 20 years they're not going to ask it of you as an adult. For you, what was your exposure to um, disability and dating growing up? I remember when I would talk to, like, adults, like my my family and stuff about it, they would say stuff like, you know, you'll meet someone and they'll look past your disability. And, you know, and that was a good thing to say at the time, but I've kind of come around to be like, I don't want people to look past it. I want people to sort of look at it and be like, yeah, I still this is still what I want because then they're completely on board with every part of you and you're not feeling like I don't want to feel like the disability is something that somebody else is going to have to kind of deal with. I've got my own emotions about it and I don't want to have to carry Mm. their emotions about it. I love that story you tell Bex where I think you and Mitch were on your third or fourth date in Mm. the staircase situation. Yeah, I guess um, to add some context to the story, Etta, um, I had probably been using apps like Tinder and Bumble for four years, like consistently before I met my now fiancé. Lots of bad experiences, lots of frogs before I met my prince. We were on our, yeah, it was like our fourth or fifth date and we'd gone downtown and we'd parked in the downtown car park and we 
got out of the building and there was no ramp to the street level. It was just like a massive staircase of stairs down to the main road. And it was like 7 p.m. on a Saturday, so we couldn't get back into the building. And um, we're freaking out. And because it's like the fourth or fifth day, I'm like, I'm not going to ask this guy to carry me down the stairs. (laughs) And there was a lot of them, so it was like a dangerous task. Um, so he offered to go and find help and to like find a way back into the building and to come and get me so we could find another way down to the street level. So he went away and I was kind of just waiting there and, you know, 10 minutes had gone past and I was like, oh, surely he'll be back soon. Then 15 minutes had passed and I was like, oh, like surely soon. And then it was getting closer to have been like half an hour and I was like, um, okay, is this guy coming back? (laughs) Like, have I just been left at the top of these stairs? Has he realised that dating a girl in a wheelchair is too hard and he's just, like, gapped it? Um, And I was like, okay, I'm going to need to call my dad and be like, right, you need to come and rescue me. I'm at the top of the stairs. My date's ditched me. Like, help. Um, And sure enough, within, like, a few minutes and I was about to pick up the phone yeah. and I saw him appear through the building with a security guard and he had just been running around that whole time, one, trying to get back into the building and then two, trying to find someone that could come and open the door to let me back in. Mm. It wasn't until um, maybe like last year that I realised I hadn't told him how I felt um, yeah. during kind of that time and... He was actually quite offended <laughs> when I told him that that's how I felt because he's like, you wouldn't, you didn't think I'd actually do that to you, did I? <laughs> and I'm like, well, obviously now, now that you know we're engaged, we're getting married, like I know, you know, you're you're my life partner. Yeah. Um, I know you wouldn't do that, but at the time, it was all of those negative experiences that I'd had before, all of those conversations where the dis- where my disability had been an issue or it had been a topic of conversation and it had been a really big factor for people. That yeah. I was like, fuck. <laughs> Like, this is it. Someone's realised it's too hard and they've just left me here. In your own experience, Edda, I guess, can you talk a little about, like, the intersectionality, um, you know, of dating when you have a disability and also being queer? I mean, it was a funny one because it was a bit like, oh, shit, like, (laughs) here's another minority that I'm part of. But it it does kind of let you off the hook a bit in terms of... um, Queer people are already kind of thinking outside the what normal is and it lets me off the hook in terms of my body and in terms of how I want to explore my sexuality because people are already kind of have a bit of imagination about um, what expectations are and what, um, what relationships look like and what sex is and what intimacy is. Like, like I think that accessibility in... Co- to like queer spaces and places that you might meet people or spend time with queer people is like still a problem. I think in terms of dating, I would much rather kind of meet people face to face and things like that. I'd much rather be off apps, but I'm on them partly because um, physical access to like bars and um, spaces where I might meet people is such a gamble, you know? So tell us a bit of, um, I mean, we've shared some dating app stories. What's your experience been like with dating, like on an app? Do you, I mean, the question I often get is, do you show your photos of yourself in a wheelchair? Yeah. Or how do you disclose it and, and that type of thing? I have photos on there of me and all my kind of like disability slogan T-shirts. And like, you know, dis- I have it. I have really in your face? <laughs> yeah. I have a T-shirt that um, my flatmate gave me that just says disabled and queer. So it, like, you know, states everything. I also have T-shirts that say um, your unsolicited advice will not cure my disability. So (laughs) I've got a picture of me with that. But, yeah, my profile at the moment kind of does say you're distracting myself from writing. Please don't ask what's wrong with you. I get that enough from random strangers on the street. Then, you know, if you're really stuck for an opener, here's a picture of my cat. And I have had quite a few people be like, oh, your cat's cute. So he's doing, you know, he's doing a good job as a, as a wingman. Do you have any um, memorable dates that you wanted to talk about, whether they're good or bad? 
I think it was a, a date recently that I went on and I'd sort of, I'd sort of said uh, to myself, okay, don't go on to your kind of disability rights soapbox or like, you know, save it. Just like slow down. Save it for like the fifth date yeah, or like, yeah. what do you mean say? Yeah, and it was like a, um, she kind of goes, oh, that just sounds pretty ableist, doesn't it? And I was like, okay, good. This is going to be like, this is going to be good. Um, you know, <laughs> and uh, that date ended with we went home and I don't know, I just want, I wanted to get, I wanted to get back and see what would happen. And um, she didn't have a money on her snapper. She said, oh, no, I won't be able to bust. And I said, oh, like, don't worry. Like, just come with me and they'll, you know, it'll be fine. They'll just wave you on. And she goes, why? Because they think you're my, they think I'm your support worker. And I was like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I was just like, just lean into it. Like, just just go, just go, with, like, roll with the ableism. And it'll, like, make some more assumptions about how helpless I am. So, yeah, that was cute. We get such intrusive questions, even outside Mm. of dating, right? Like, I mean, I've had, like, a random stranger come up to me in, like, a public bathroom, ask me if I can have sex. I wish that I was brave enough to be like, why are you you propositioning me, you know? Like, (laughs) but I'm not. That's a good comeback. I haven't been brave enough to to do that. You know, I'll get you to um, also be interested to know a bit about um, some of the research you've done around, Mm. like, sex education and disability. Yeah. I mean, we were in sex ed class together and there was no mention of disability at high school. No. Yeah, and that's kind of why I ended up doing that research is that a friend who was working in public health, I started talking about this thing of kind of, yeah, being a teenager and not hearing discussion of disability at all in in sex ed. So how we framed it was around sex education and what people's experiences of sex education had been. And I really just, because we went to a school that was kind of so openly affirming of queer people and we went to a school that, you know, was quite inclusive, but it just didn't get mentioned. And as kind of difficult as it was to hear that disabled people are so kind of poorly served by our sex ed curriculum, it was quite affirming in a way to hear that it hadn't just been, you know, me feeling those absences. And the real question was, like, you know, how does that sort of shape your sense of self, like, later on in life? And, yeah, and people really feeling, like, still carrying those questions into, like, early adulthood of, like, is this for me? Am I going to... Is this going to be part of my life? Yeah, how much do we talk about disability with our partners? And, you know, down to things like sort of how do you deal with muscle tension in sex or how do you deal with, like, positioning or being comfortable or, like, pain, all these kind of things that we contend with in our lives or like medication or whatever, you know, all these things that we live in our bodies anyway and how how those impact our sexuality. The um, cool thing about like sexual expression to me for disabled people is that it's like an opportunity to experience your body differently. I think that's the powerful thing about it for anyone, but for people who the, the kind of conversations around what it is to be disabled is there's so much negative discourse there and negative thinking that um, for me, yeah, sexual expression really exciting in that way. It creates a space for people to, to experience their bodies as like good things and, and powerful things, like to be desired and, and have desires and also just like on a really basic level that touch is really important and, and touch that isn't... Um, functional touch that's not about support or basic needs, um, showering and dressing and those kind of things that it's about, yeah, that it is connected to pleasure and desire and all those things. And that's it for this episode of What's Wrong With You. To watch a behind the scenes video on how we made this podcast, Or if you want to listen to our other episodes, head to stuff.co.nz forward slash what's wrong with you. Coming up in the next episode. Well, the Bible says that God heals stuff. And so I'm like, why can't he regrow limbs? If he wants to do that with me, then have at it. I'll take it, you know, so... 
And then this guy came and was like, oh, can I pray for you? And I said, yes. And then they were like, okay, good, let's go around the corner to this, like, alley. Mm. And I was like, oh, okay, mm. no. <laughs> no. You no, can pray no. for me in your own time. I'm not coming with you down some <laughs> alley, please. This podcast was made with support from New Zealand On Air. Thank you to our guests, Lauren Savage, Timothy Young and Henrietta Bollinger, as well as Chris Dow Yardley, Adam Dudding, Carol Hirschfeld, Eugene Bingham, Grace Stratton and All Is For All. This episode was sponsored by Every Human, an online platform selling life-changing adaptive clothing, footwear and lifestyle products. It's the home of the ultimate shopping experience for people with disabilities. Shop the range at everyhuman.com.au.